Hello, everybody. Dr. Tom Walton here to talk a little bit about the cervical region and more specifically cervical pathologies and even more specifically uh, musculoskeletal cervical pathologies, right? So in the cervical region, a lot of things could go wrong. Um, you could have problems with local structures and whenever somebody comes in complaining about uh, a problem somewhere in some sort of pathologic based assessment, right, I usually try to think of the structures that are immediately at the location of their complaint. And then, and then I might start looking into referral symptoms from other regions, right? So in the cervical spine, we have these sorts of local structures, but then we could be getting symptom referrals like problems with swallowing or breathing which could be, um, you know, problems in the brain or brainstem or down here, down here, down here in the chest, working its way up. So that, that you could get referrals from other places as well. But generally speaking, when we're talking about the musculoskeletal system, it's going to be fairly local. We're going to be dealing mostly with muscles and joints of the cervical spine, right? So we're looking at uh, the things I'm going to cover right here, right? Muscles, joints, ligaments, bones, nerves. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. That is in the musculoskeletal system that I am interested in. Uh, I'm going to touch briefly on vasculature uh, because I think it's important to understand how certain therapies uh, could affect the vasculature and how a lot of fear has been built up around certain therapies around uh, the cervical spine as well, specifically a cervical manipulation and its ties to uh, arterial dissections, right, and strokes, and whether that is or whether that is not founded in some sort of legitimate fear. So I, I do want to spend a fair amount of time talking about that. Um, and then other things that we're really not going to cover in this little section would be uh, lymph, skin, glands, and organs, right, the other stuff around here. That's a, that's a big fat nope. This goiter can get, get right on out of here because we are not covering that in here. Um, so this sort of stuff will come up in, in other areas of your education here, right? So anyway, let's look at the general pathology list. Here we go. So over here on the left side of the screen, um, we've got the, the most common presentations. And over here on the right, we've got things we need to consider but aren't nearly as common. No matter what medical schools will tell you, Radiculopathy is not even close to being as common as, as strains and sprains. And strains and sprains aren't even as close to being as common as cervical tension and joint dysfunction, right? So I, I very much like to approach this um, with the most common things first. I think that's a good place to go. Get the low hanging fruit before you start looking for weird fractures and instabilities or vascular problems. Yes, this is important. And yes, you need to know how to diagnose it, but also keep in mind, this is not very common. This I see every day I'm in my clinic and multiple times a day, I'll go through 25 to 30 people all with the same problems, right, the neck. And it's not arterial dissections. It's not neck fractures. It's joint dysfunction, muscle tension, strains and sprains primarily, and occasionally facet syndromes. Like that's what I'm seeing primarily, right? So in this little lecturette, I'd like to talk first about these two, muscle tension and joint dysfunction, right? Because those are gonna be the most common uh, non-traumatic presentations. So my functional exams, or they're going to be present in any sort of traumatic presentation as well. Because as there is a trauma, your body goes on lockdown, you develop muscle tension, and that leads to movement pattern problems, joint dysfunction, right? So these are going to be present in pathology and without pathology, so functional or traumatic-based assessments. These three are going to be the most common cervical complaints that we're going to see with some sort of traumatic-based uh, presentation, meaning they come in with pain generally following a very specific incident or generally following some sort of pattern that was building, right? Like a new activity or a sleep posture or there was an incident, right? These are gonna be the most common for that. But then, like I said, we will take a little bit of time and look at these because they are very, very important. They're just not common, okay? So moving right along, let's talk about muscle tension. So muscle, muscle tension, I'm going to when we talk about every single region of the body, this is going to be the first thing I will 
always talk about. Right? If we are approaching this in terms of functional medicine and preventative care, this is like the first thing we should get a, get, get a grasp on. Right? It just gets skipped over completely. But this is something that is very valid and should be treated. Right? Because this, I think, is what is what will lead to most other pathologies, short of direct traumas. Right? Most other pathologies in the musculoskeletal system. Right? So muscle tension. I'm also defining it as myospasm type muscles. It could be could be presence of trigger points. So little uh, in it, little contractile states of myofibers and fibrils. Right? And generally, your symptoms are going to be dull, achy, diffuse sort of pain, right? Maybe you have limitations in range of motion, right? Occasionally, you're going to see twitching muscles or a, a visual or palpable nodule, like a very tight little spot up in the neck, right? How do you get this stuff? Multifactorial. This could be coming from anything, right? Stress would probably be the most common thing, either psychosocial or postural type stresses. Right, so you're sitting at a desk all day, or you're doing something weird. You're looking at a computer monitor over here. You're driving in your car, whatever, right? Or uh, you're under a lot of psychosocial stress, and someone's yelling at you, and or or just a lot of tension in your life, and you tend shoulders tend to come up, and tension tends to develop around the neck, right? Posture fatigue, dehydration, electrolyte balance, etc. There's so many. Or post uh, post injury, post traumatic would be another one, right? So how do you diagnose this? Well, it's pretty simple. You just touch it. You palpate it. If it feels tight, yeah, it's tight. That's muscle tension, right? Uh, another way you could, a less common way, would be uses, using different ranges of motion. ROM, ROM is a range of motion. So that could be a secondary way to diagnose this. But the primary way you're going to diagnose muscle tension is via palpation, right? And then the question is, all right, we got it. We diagnosed it. How do we treat it? Well, I'm always going to ask you this question. When any, anyone ever asks me, how do you treat this? How do you treat that? Right? I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to say, what is your goal? Right? What is your goal of therapy with this patient? Right? And further, at this time and with this specific patient, right? at this time of injury or with whatever patient you're dealing with who has other sorts of problems. What is your general goal? So some general goals for treating muscle tension would be decreasing the tension, right? Maybe increasing circulation and decreasing contributing factors, right? Those are just some goals. Other ones would be improving range of motion, decreasing pain, right? Improving general function, improving strength. There could be a lot of things, right? And then the next question is, okay, now that you have your goal, how do you want to accomplish this? How do you want to accomplish this therapy, right? I would suggest some form of uh, manual therapy. Obviously, I'm going to say that. I'm a chiropractor. I work with my hands. I think it works really, really well. But other things you can do, different forms of mental health, right? Counselors or meditation or any, anything like that to calm the system down. Uh, topical medicines, different machines, e stim massagers, those work really good. You could go for a muscle relaxant and some sort of internal medication, right? So there's a lot of different ways to accomplish this, but these are some. Those are some of the ways, right? And then the other thing I want to sort of go over is common referral patterns, right? Trigger point referral patterns. So there was this doc, Janet Travell, in the, in the 1950s, who was actually the first female doc to uh, President, President uh, Kennedy. Um, but she was fascinated with this idea of muscular pain referrals, meaning you could have a problem like right here on the sternocleidomastoid muscle, right at a little X, right where a little cursor's over. There might be a little nodule or, or trigger point or a little sort of area where, where um, the local, local cellular, cellular debris is building up because circulation can't get in there very well, and it's creating an irritating spot. You may feel discomfort at that location with a certain amount of pressure, but generally, you're not going to feel it right there. You're going to get this weird diffuse aching at the back of your head up here or sometimes around the eye or face, right? And she was able to figure this out by paying these medical students money to inject them with different sorts of painful solutions to stimulate this, uh, this, this reaction and then ask them where they felt it. So she would take a needle and jab it in there and different locations and ask students where they felt it. And this is what they reported. So this is very, very interesting to know 
because sometimes patients will come in talking about like an you know, upper trapezius referral pattern, but they, they won't come in saying my upper trapezius is tight. They'll come in saying, I have this dull, achy pain that is sort of looping over my ear like this, right? And they're just drawing the referral pattern for the upper trap. So then I go over, I squeeze right here on the upper trap and hold it for about 10 seconds. I go, whoa, 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 I'm getting that, that pain again, that headache pain. Like, okay, great. That is an upper trapezius trigger point. That's very, very easy to fix, right? So these are some common ones. The upper trap tends to refer more like this, SCM, a lot of auricular or uh, posterior to the ear pain or temporal type stuff. The suboccipital muscles, very similar. You got this sort of band coming across, again, headache muscles. Uh, splenius cervicis and splenius capitis, back of the head, top of the head, right? Temporalis muscle, once again, very similar to suboccipitals, right? Um, uh, I'm sorry, semispinalis cervicis. And then we have splenius cervicis over here, more of that sort of right at the base of the neck. You know, a lot of times when this muscle spasms following a poor night of sleep, for instance, People come in with a lot of pain right at that location, right? Um, a few other muscles in that area, right? Scalenes, scalene muscles, but they don't tend to refer up. They tend to refer down the arm, which is very similar to like a radiculopathy type presentation or neurologic type presentation, right? Um, different elements there. Your levator scap super common. It's going to be sort of periscapular up the side of the neck and then out towards the, the posterior shoulder here. Your platysma. Your platysma, remember that muscle? Is that a weird one? Like that, right? That little trigger points on that can cause all sorts of jaw and facial pains as well. Right? And this isn't even all of them. These are just some of the more common ones. I think having a trigger point chart is super, super handy, right? To, to sort of jump on these things right away. And then the other thing I want to talk about with um, muscle tension is this thing called upper cross syndrome. It's just a super common presentation of facilitation and inhibition patterns of local muscular muscles, musculature. I almost said muscles, right? So a lot of times what you will see is a, a patient with an anterior head, right? The traps and the shoulders are up and rolled in, right? As a result, we end up with an upper cervical extension, a lower cervical flexion, and an upper thoracic hyperlordosis, uh, excuse me, hyperkyphosis, right? Sort of rolled in on itself and shoulders internally rotated, right? It's that classic student syndrome or desk syndrome or driving or posture, right? You just sort of start slumping forward and then maintaining this position for long periods of time, right? So what we tend to see is facilitated or activated SCM, right? Pulling your sort of chin forward, upper cervical extension, lower cervical flexion. You see activation of the pectoralis muscle, so that's you know, rolling your shoulders in, activation of the upper trapezius pulling and levator, pulling your shoulders sort of up, right? And as a result, we tend to see reciprocal inhibitory patterns for antagonistic muscles. So every time the pecs, right, and the SCM are gonna be firing up, your serratus anterior and little lower traps are starting to get inhibited, similar to the deep neck flexors, right? Longus capitis and longus coli tend to be chronically lengthened and inhibited because we have antagonistic muscles constantly firing, turning on, right? So the treatment goal generally is to inhibit the facilitated muscles. So find a way to relax these muscles, stretch them, relax them, and then stimulate or facilitate the inhibited muscles. Wake these ones up, activate them, right? That sort of thing. And then something I just want to talk really quickly about, I, I don't want you to conflate the idea of inhibition and weakness. Now, frequently, chronically inhibited muscles do become weak, but an inhibited muscle isn't necessarily weak. You could have a very strong serratus anterior and lower trapezius muscle, but if your pectoralis major muscle is constantly firing and activated, these are constantly turned off. Right? Or if your upper trap is constantly firing, your lower trap is probably going to be constantly turning off, right? Because they're going to be pulling the scapula in different directions, right? So inhibition doesn't equal weakness. Frequently they go together, but it doesn't equal weakness. So sometimes it's not that you need to strengthen these muscles, it's that you just need to activate them. You need to turn them on, right? So contract them a few times, 
you know, work on postural type exercises. Okay. More of that in the next sections to come too. And the other pathology I want to talk briefly about is joint dysfunction, right? So this is, I think, one of the most misunderstood diagnoses. Uh, and I don't think a lot of the medical community has given it any sort of um, le legitimate thought or really tried to address this or recognize that this is a thing, right? In certain areas, like the patella or patella tracking disorders, everyone agrees like, oh yeah, patellofemoral pain syndrome, runner's knee, like, oh, that's a thing, you know, but that's the only joint that happens in. It couldn't possibly happen in the neck. There's joints all throughout your body, right? Anytime you have a joint, if you have movement problems, it's gonna to lead to the same types of pain and, and breakdown of tissues, right? So joint dysfunction, sometimes called a locked joint, or in the chiropractic world, sometimes called the subluxation. I, I very much dislike this term because it overlaps with the medical subluxation, which is something totally different. So I don't tend to use that term at all. I prefer joint dysfunction. And when I'm speaking about joint dysfunction, I am talking specifically about aberrant arthrokinematics, right? Aberrant, bad, arthrokinematics, joint movement. So we're looking at faulty joint movements. Right. Long term, what we're sort of looking at with this is a constant rubbing of joint surfaces together in a certain way or a constant stress on certain structures. Right. When we get that, we start to get irritation. Irritation is ultimately going to lead to inflammation and inflammation is a very destructive process that's happening. So long term, you're going to start seeing destruction of cartilaginous surfaces. Right. And even longer than that, you're going to start seeing your body respond by building up bone and more bony tissue, right? That's how your body knows how to respond to constant areas of stress. It responds by building up bone. And then you get things like arthritis and spondylosis, right? And you get bone sores, little bony outcropping that leads to inflammation of the joint more and more and more because your joint space is narrowed significantly. So it's very, very easy to irritate that area again, right? So general symptoms, you're gonna see limitations in ranges of motion, joint specific. Now it's easier to assess um, in single joints. When we get under the spine, it's harder to really isolate which joint it is, right? And we're gonna look at that in a second. So general decreases in range of motion, a stiffness, and you might have sort of diffuse aches, right? We may not have a full blown inflammatory response. It's just sort of achy. Right? Generally, it's a result of altered movement anywhere in the body. It's sequela to um, uh, 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 any sort of trauma, but it's also going to be present with any time you have joint or uh, muscle tension. Right? Anytime muscles are contracting, they're pulling joints in positions that aren't they aren't designed to move in. Right? If we're always sort of tight on this side and then I go to move, my right side is getting compressed. A whole lot as I'm as I'm moving throughout my normal ranges of motion. That is, you're starting to get wear and tear type patterns, right? Um, so in order to diagnose this, passive range of motion generally is what we're looking at. And then when we're looking at things like the cervical spine, we really want to do segmental motion palpation, right? So that passive range of motion in the cervical spine tends to be kind of global, meaning all the joints are moving. And it's very hard to isolate. So it's nice to then go in and try to individually move each joint. Now, realistically, can you do that? It depends on who you ask, right? And there is a, a certainly a degree of skill that goes with this, right? But I do think there are ways to isolate motions of at least upper, middle, and lower joints to get a ballpark idea. And I can certainly say right side or left side, right? So segmental motion palpation would be the best way to diagnose joint dysfunction, right? What is your goal or uh, treatment? Or how do you treat this? What is your goal? What is your goal at this time with this patient, right? General goals are gonna be increased ranges of motion, right? Decrease the local tension in the area and decrease the contributing factors, work on posture, right? How do you accomplish this? Wow, mobilizations work really, really well for this, grades three through five, right? I think these are the go-to for treating this kind of thing. Other things, stretching and traction. Right? I think those are some excellent choices as well. Certainly not all of them, but I think those are some of the best choices you could do. Right, And then I want to kind of present this sort of Mobius loop, because if we're dealing with preventative care, 
right, before problems arise, joint dysfunction and muscle tension are like two things I think you should get on all the time right away, right? Because a lot of times joint dysfunction leads to inflammation, which leads to pain, which leads to spasm, which leads to more joint dysfunction. Ah, we're stuck in this Mobius loop. Or pain leads to spasm, joint dysfunction, inflammation. Maybe you start with spasm, joint dysfunction, inflammation, pain, pain. Maybe you start with inflammation. And that's kind of a weird one to start with. But pain, spasm, right? You're just in this sort of stuck positive reinforcement loop. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, here's your treatment secret, right? If you have joint dysfunction, move it, correct it. You got inflammation, control that inflammation. Reduce the pain and relax the spasm, right? That's your general treatment secret. Um, I am going to talk about this again and again and again in every single region of the body because this is something I really want you to know.